There's nothing like having somebody come up, try to trap you in basically saying, what's your bottom line? In front of a bunch of people trying to get them kind of to embarrass you or at least to reveal something about you. And that's kind of what happened to Jesus. I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but it's happened to me a couple times. When you're a rector, people kind of like to, you know, there's a, even a forum that we call Stump the Rector. And with me, it's not that difficult. But um, there are these realities of people just kind of like to get you. And that's kind of what's going on in this gospel. And yet, Jesus, you know, is asked, which is greatest, Law, what is the greatest commandment? And he recites the summary of the law. Love God with all that you have and love your neighbor as yourself. The thing that is interesting about this is that Jesus links those two. Jesus says that those two work together. Because I think there's such a temptation, especially in what I would call modern Christianity, is that we love God. To hell with our neighbors. And I think there's a temptation there because, you know, we can kind of adore Almighty God, but not really have to get messy. And so I think Jesus very intentionally, very wisely, stepped out of the trap and linked these two commandments. It says, love God with all that you are. And love your neighbor as yourself. And we don't have to go too far into the Gospels to see what Jesus thinks about who our neighbor is. And that's where it just gets really sticky. And where I do have some compassion for those type of Christians who would like to say that, oh, I don't have to worry about that. I'm just going to adore God. I'm just going to get a little Jesus. Because Jesus pulls no punches when he says that your neighbor is not your um, supper club. It's not the people at your country club. It's not the people who vote the way you do, who agree with you, who like right one more than right two. It's everyone. Your fellow humans. And I think we need to hear that as humans more than ever, and as, especially as Christians. If we are to say that we are followers of Jesus Christ, It is this work of pulling these these commandments together that they knit the fabric back that is so torn in America, at least right now, and I believe around the world. This idea that my position on an issue is the most important thing. The most important thing is that we are children of God. We don't have to agree with one another. We definitely don't have to be disagreeable about it. But we can have mutual respect. And that's what I think has been lost. And so in this gospel, we hear about our work. And what is our work as Christians, as people? It's to love God. What does that look like? How do we love God? I believe it's linked to that second one, just like Jesus said, love your neighbor. I want to say that freedom is something that we we talk about in this country a lot. And what I have started to kind of gather, and and I'm a little slow, in my almost 52 years, you'd think I'd been here by now, but I'm learning that American freedom sounds a little bit like I get to do whatever the hell I want to do. And that's, that's not freedom. That's just some sort of bond, some other kind of bondage. Freedom is when we are connected. And that when we serve God and serve one another, we p- find perfect freedom. I want you to think about the last time that you had the opportunity to give. I'm not talking about writing a check. I'm talking about give. I listened to Ashley Wade tell a story about how she was able to go around with her kids and do things and how her face was lit up. And I can imagine what Amos and Issa were like. 
It is in that act of giving that we find our purpose. It's why I am always amazed that I talk to men, generally speaking. I'm not saying that this doesn't happen with women, but men who are about 70. Not every man that's 70, but I've had more than a few. And they've retired. They've made it. They get to do whatever the hell they want to do. They're free. And wow the misery that descends upon them sometimes. Freedom is not to do whatever we want to do, whenever we want to do it. Freedom is when we have purpose to serve, when we use our life up. I love that understanding of our life as a gift and we get to just use it up. And so might we think about our life of our freedom in the context of these commandments. To love God so much that we're just used up at the end of our life. And how we do that is by loving our neighbor. In extravagant and perhaps reckless ways. Yes, I said that. I want you to think about that for a minute. The next nine or 10 days in this country, Please don't watch the news. Just do that favor for me and for yourself. You kind of know what the news is. And I know that New Yorker article or that cartoon has never been more, never been more true for me. Where it's two people walking along and the one person says, my desire to stay well informed is at odds with my desire to stay sane. Go with sanity, I urge you. But I also urge you to think about on November 4th, we probably won't know who the next president is going to be, but the sun will probably come up and we will probably need to get on with it. And so if we're hanging all of our hope on this election, I suggest we're setting ourselves up. But if we hang all of our hope on these commandments, I think we might be on to something. So help me, pray for me, that I will take these commandments and not just read them, but let them mark my heart so that I may be about this business of loving of caring for others, of a perfect freedom that unites my love of God and my love of neighbor and my love of self. And know that I will be praying for you. Love God with all that you have and love your neighbor as yourself.